Hello, everyone, and welcome to the C-Sharp 101 class. This is week four. And with us, we have Nelson and Gavin and myself, Jason Busby. So this week, we are going to kick things off with a quick reminder that you will find the password for, I know we've said this for the last two weeks now, but I'm going to continue to say it because there's still a lot of people that seem to have problems with this. Nelson, go ahead and bring up a browser. Head on over to 3D Buzz. You will find the password at 3dbuzz.com. If you click on the live classes link, as Nelson has highlighted there, within five minutes before the start of class, find the class, and it, it, it'll be very easy. It's going to be the one that's highlighted with a gray border around it. And just refresh until you see the P, the blue P, show up. And then just simply click it. And that is where you will find the password. We are now using the calendar system just so we have one place to put password, registration links, links to course information, links to homework, etc. It makes things uh, a lot easier for everybody as opposed to the information being buried deep in a forum post somewhere. So again, just for those of you that are new to going here, please make sure that you do this. Um, and Sarah Dak, I went there five minutes. I said within five minutes. Um, so it's not, it's not always going to be five minutes right on the spot. It's just within five minutes, it'll be posted. And then there you can grab, just keep refreshing the page. Um, so it was there about two minutes to eight. Seggy, that's within five minutes. That's right of class start time. So, I mean, that, it, it's not an automated thing. I, ha I have to wait until I get the start webinar notice from Citrix. Once I get that, it asks for the password to be entered. So I have to put the password in once that's accepted. Then I have to go over here and post it. And if I have to sit there and wait for just a minute for the Citrix feedback to come in or if I'm running a minute behind, um, any of these things can cause a minute or so delay. That's why I always say within five minutes. And we never start um, actual lecture right on the dot at 3 o'clock. And it will never be that way. Um, so that gives people time who are always running a few minutes late. coming. I mean, like we've already gone up about seven more people, so actually about eight people, since um, 3 o'clock. So, again, this is where you're going to find the information for everything pertaining to your class. I'm also going to – this is this is something that's very important, and this is a new piece of information. I'm going to end up having Nelson put a little section in here probably sometime later this week that is an emergency protocol that can be followed if something goes wrong. And if, for whatever reason, the entire webinar blows up for some reason and we need to restart it or if the link changes when we're starting it, anything whatsoever, we will be able to just post an update inside the emergency protocol text field and you'll be able to see what, like, I mean, if we had a power outage, it would be very easy for us to jump on our phone and head on over to 3D Buzz and update the emergency protocol section, letting you know that power just went out. Uh, anything, basically, to let you guys know what's going on if an emergency does indeed happen. Um, so that'll be the first time this has been mentioned, and I will mention it a few other times because I'm sure we're going to need it. Now, so go ahead and close that out for me. The next thing, BuzzNet. We've been talking about this for the last uh, good week. Um, we are using only the web-based BuzzNet, so please make sure to join in here. Um, it's just buzznet.3dbuzz.com, and then log in with your 3D Buzz um, uh, credentials. Also, if you um, want to get involved, which uh, we always encourage you guys to, you'll notice Nelson is currently pointing to the Participate button. This is how you click it. Click. Now, we'll start off. We'll generally issue a reset pulse, which will set everybody to not ready. And then as you're working, uh, the moment you get completed, please remember to click the ready button, and that lets us know. You'll notice on the right-hand side all the people that are green. It lets us know on our end that you're ready. Um, students don't Go see on. this window. What's that, Kevin? You've got a few people that are logged in more than once. Yeah, that's uh, – Nelson, that means that piece of code's not working, by the way. 
Should be. He is right. Alpo, Segfault. Uh... Uh, I think my Buzznet just crashed. <clears throat> Give me a sec. How'd you crash it? I don't know. Is this your code? Everybody. Just, oh, I got it too. I crashed as well. Did you get an exception? Yep, yep. Yeah, I did. Okay, there we go. Now there's only one of everybody in the list. I've crashed. Yeah, every error. Model dot user is undefined. Yeah, but I just clicked OK and it continued to run. Hmm. Um, Wonder what caused that. Well, well, let's look at. Let's worry about that, Nelson, afterwards, uh, since we're recording now. But please make sure to use the. Um, Buzznet.3dbuzz.com. It's web-based. Um, if your Buzznet stops updating, please check your browser version. We, we can't support really, really old browsers. Uh, we're supporting the more current ones. That, that is very important. Otherwise, the older browsers, it's going to um, – you'll end up timing out, and you'll stop getting updates. Just update your browser. Um, let's see. Anything else? As far as announcements, I don't think so. So for today, um, let's go ahead and kick off with a quick discussion about homework. Uh, Gavin, go ahead and let everybody know what's up with that. There was a couple of people I saw making posts over in BuzzNet regarding uh, they had not seen feedback. And I think we had talked about that last week, but let's go ahead and mention it again. Yeah, um, these we've got multiple classes running and quite a lot of people doing these classes as well. Basically, um, it could take me up to a week to get to the uh, homework for a particular class once it's once the submission date is passed. Um, I while we're on the subject, please make sure you follow the submission guidelines on the website. They are. Um, relatively clear. Had a few people who didn't manage for week two's homework to correctly submit their program.cs file um, or any other CS files they needed. I know there were some problems with submitting, but I think those were all sorted out. But um, Nelson, could you grab a open up a Visual Studio project and, and show people, or just any <clears throat> any Visual Studio project? It doesn't really matter. Um, Da, da, da. Uh, actually, I do want to point this out. Um, when you're using the Express version, um, it's only going to ask you to save your project to disk when you either close or hit Control, um, Shift, Save. So then once you save it, then it, I think this is what Gavin was getting at, right? You mean this? Yeah, right. That there... That C that console application the console application two project, and Nelson very helpfully has extensions turned off, um, <laughs> which I like my folder extensions on. But you'll see that is a I believe that's a CS project, isn't it? No, that's a Slim. Oh, that's a Slim. See, here we go. That uh, well, do you want to explain about what those are? Because it is not yeah. in detail, but just briefly, because. It's people have been sending me various different things. <laughs> um, okay, the SLIN SLN file is going to be your solution. So that's what is showing up in the Solution Explorer. That's the unit of uh, that Visual Studio understands at a broad level is the solution. Inside of each of these folders, however, there's a CS proj. Now, I do want to point out that the SUO file and the csproj.user file are both garbage files that aren't required. They won't hurt if you send them in, but they're just don't worry about them. The ones that you're worried about are going to be the SLINs and the CS projects. Well, this, actually, this individual project. I've had different people who obviously had problems submitting their whole solution. Um, one person sent me their CS proj, but nothing else. One person sent me their SLIN file. In fact, two people sent me SLIN files and nothing else, I think. Um, the thing that you've actually been working in, and, and you can see it quite well here with the browser and Visual Studio, is the program.cs file. Uh, really, for anything we've done so far, you don't need to go outside of that. That is what you're editing. That is what actually contains your code. That is what you need to submit to me for homeworks, um, certainly at this stage where it's all basically within one class. Uh, if you don't submit that, I can't mark it. 
and I've up to now chased a few people who um, have been sending the wrong thing in because we had the confusion and haven't, been, haven't uh, had to sort out the logistics behind that. But um, really, from now on, I, I've, I've had I had over ninety submissions for the second week, and of those, about half a dozen hadn't either hadn't followed the submission guidelines or had basically just submitted failed to submit the actual program file i'm not going to be chasing people as a rule um because there's just only so many hours in the day <laughs> okay um, good enough also, also feedback you're not giving individual feedback to every single person are you i'm not giving individual feedback um it, it, this is one of those no news is good news situations um as it happens, I have just finished marking the majority of the week two homeworks, and with a couple of exceptions, in fact, if I just get my Dropbox open one second, uh, homework C sharp week two, no C sharp marking list, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. There were nine that didn't uh, immediately pass. There were some very good ones. So I'll just give special shout outs. Um, A and Rico, Beho style, uh, Kiza and uh, Kiarisk. Tyre gets special bonus points for having a particularly tidy code file. Very clear what was going on where. Uh, Voodoo Hoodoo and Wolf Knightley both made me laugh out loud, so yes, that was good. Uh, a few of you, are we, are we, are we, um, we did specify my, uh, descending order, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, four people sorted into ascending order. Should I, uh, mention who they are? No, that's, that's, that's good enough. I I mean. not, yeah, yeah. Um... And two people used a ray dot sort, and they are instant fails down in 3D and Z Origin. <laughs> you do get named because I we mentioned it about five different times. Uh, Seridak, you were lucky, sir. He actually resubmitted having used a ray dot sort the first time. But yes, kind of missed the point, really. Those two. Um, other than that, everyone very good. Um, I will send out a quick uh, PM to everyone that I've got on my list. Uh, I'll do that in a minute once Nelson starts talking. Okay. Uh, but that's all I've got, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Gavin. So with that, let's go ahead and turn our attention to today's class. Uh, what we're going to be looking at today is going to be um, an introduction to... Methods, what methods are, method names, um, parameters, return types, default parameters, etc. We're going to take a look at method invocations, or simply put, just calling methods. Um, we're going to talk about local variables and scope within methods. We'll also talk about the return keyword and method overloading. So that's what we've got lined up for today. And Nelson, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so methods. <clears throat> so we've already been actually writing a method, and we've been using lots of methods, but we never really defined what a method is. Um, hopefully, you know, people have sort of got a, a feel for what methods are, but, you know, obviously in this lesson we're going to be, uh, you know, explicitly defining them, how to use them, and how to write them. So a method is the block of executable code within a class in C Sharp or within a type of C Sharp. And that is where you put executable code. It goes in methods. Um, so for example, right here, what I've highlighted is the main method. Uh, the main method is like we've discussed before, the entry point to the application. You'll notice a few characteristics of the main method that are true for all methods. We have right here are what are called modifiers. Um, we have right here what's called the return type. We have the name. Then we have an open parenthesis followed by types, followed by identifiers, 
and then a close parenthesis. These are the parameters. So the co different components of a method is the modifiers, the return type, the name, and the parameters. If I wanted to, I could come down here and add another static void method. And I have now just defined another method. Again, modifiers, return type, identifier, parameters, and then of course, like most C-sharp constructs, a block of executable code. So I don't know how far we should talk about the static modifier today. Um, is that something that it it wouldn't make much sense to our honest beginners here so um that that's that's going to be something that we can save uh until a little bit later okay so for now take the static key uh, modifier for granted all the methods that you will be writing within the class uh, program will not be accessible unless you add the static keyword so I just want to point that out. As you're writing methods within the program for this week, just add the static keyword um, modifier to all of your methods. Otherwise, things will not work correctly. OK, so we've kind of talked about, or I've, I've identified the structure, but I doubt that many of the beginners here understand each component or what they do. I do want to point out or I, I wanna have a, a starting point here about what a method is. So I'm going to ignore void and I'm going to ignore the parameter list. We're going to start with just the concept of invoking a method and a method that has an identifier. Again, ignore static. If you do not add this uh, modifier to your methods within program, you will not be able to use them properly. You will get errors and they'll look very scary. So now that we have a method defined here inside of this, this class program, remember that execution still starts in the main method. So this, this block of code, and we can put any code we want into this method, but it's not gonna do anything yet. If I were to hit F5, you see that the console window just you know vanishes really quickly. I can go ahead and add a console.read key right here and, you see that we're halting execution on line 12 and I hit a key and nothing else happens. So what you have to actually do in order to make a methods code execute is invoke it. And you invoke a method, um, well, we, we've already seen plenty of method invocations. Console.readkey is a method that we've been invoking quite, op quite often. And actually, uh, it's, method and, and actually it's read key, which is the method. Yeah, read so, key is the method, console is the type that read key is under. Right. So how would we invoke method one? Well, you see that method one is under a class called program and it's called method one. So we could do program dot method one. And then as far as what we put right here, we'll talk about that in a second. At the moment, this is just going to be an empty list of arguments. So now that we've invoked that method, I can go ahead and hit a five and you see that execution actually jumped all the way from line 12 to line 19. Because we invoke this method and because this method is defined as uh, console.writeLine in method one, uh, the execution actually left main temporarily, jumped into method one, executed the block of code in method one, and then jumped all the way back into main. So what we can do even, we could call this a bunch of times in a row, where what's happening is method one's being invoked, 22 is being executed, then the method exits because there's nothing left on the method. But unlike when main exits, because remember main is the entry point to our application, um, when main exits, your program exits. When a method that you define under main ex uh, exits, it returns back to where you invoked it from, which in this case is gonna be lines 12, 13, 14, and 15. So this method call is really straightforward and we can do it, we can use it in any construct that we've talked about thus far. So for example, I can say for int i equals zero, i smaller than 10, i plus plus, I can go ahead and say program.method1 and I can invoke it over and over and over and over again, just as if it was a method inside of the BCL. It's just, I defined it myself. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit everybody's, uh, or switch everybody's reset over, which, did it reset for anybody? Jason? Let me take a peek, no. Uh, what happens if you press it, Jason?
Nope. It doesn't like you either. Nope. What's that matter? Oh, there we go. It is actually reset. Meta said it's it's being really slow. It's it's not showing reset on my end. Is it because I didn't re jump back in it after it crashed earlier? Possibly. So I'll go ahead and ref I just refreshed and it it just reset for me. Okay. So everybody should be reset and and if you're just showing being... yeah if not just um, refresh your your screen. Did you say you figured out or you saw why it crashed or you don't know? I don't know. Okay. I, I didn't. I didn't pull up the logs. I'm sure it was server side. Yeah, every everybody's showing properly uh, reset now. Once I refreshed. Okay. Yeah, it it does. I, I'm going to talk to Nelson about that. Once you refresh, you'll need to log back in. Okay, so. All right, so go ahead and type this code out and hit ready when you're done. And then I'll answer questions. What's that? Is that after you refreshed? Yeah, after, um, after Meta refreshed, just letting you know, Nelson. Uh -huh. It's now on her screen. I just took a look at it. It's now showing everybody that says something's repeating four times in the. Um, let me see if mine's doing that. Yep, mine's. I'm getting double repeats now. I'm not. And Jen says no participate button after the refresh. What? That isn't possible. Um. Um. Okay. If you go ahead and pause the recording, I can reset reset the IIS site. Okay. Okay, so we've resumed, Nelson. Okay, so um, we did get some questions in, but I definitely want people to type this out, specifically line 25. Um, you're going to have to get used to typing this kind of code out because, well, in C Sharp, you make methods and you put code inside of methods. And you make classes, and you put methods inside of classes, and you put code inside of methods inside of classes. So you will be doing this very, very, very often. Uh, da -da. Okay, so um, be sure you type that out. I'm going to go ahead and start answering some questions here. Um, doesn't it main method need the string args? <clears throat> no, it actually doesn't. Um, but it, it will be placed there by default. And once we start talking about parameters, we will get cover why it's there or what it does. Um, if it's in the same class, do you have to type program.method1? You do not. I just wanted to make things very explicit first. Um, but I'm quickly going to go ahead and, yeah. Basic, where did the sound go? Can you, guys, can you guys still hear us? I can still hear you just fine. I can still hear you. Hmm. Thanks, guys. Okay, Enrico, it's probably just a network glitch somewhere along the hops to your place. Five by five. All right. All right, continue. Okay, so um, is everybody good so far? Does anybody have any more questions about what I have typed out? Again, we're going to be covering returns and parameters uh, very, very shortly here. But just the concept, the biggest concept that I'm tr trying to show right now is that execution isn't necessarily linear in programming. Um, what you have here, well, it is linear, but it's not going to be contained within a single method. What we have here is we are referencing an external bit of code within this method. And what we're doing is we're invoking it. We're invoking it just like we do with console.readkey, where we give execution to console.readkey. In this, on line 12, we are giving execution to method 1. Method one then can perform any operation he sees fit, and then when he returns, whoever invoked him is going to get um, uh, execution back, and it'll continue linearly down the method until it hits another method call, in which case execution will jump to that method, and so on and so on. Um, TJ, no. You got to always got to sure. read the question. 
Um, if it's in with the same class, do you have to type program.method1? You do not, but I just wanted to make, right now I'm just talking about the concept of taking execution and placing it into another bit of code, having that execution then return back to the caller. Um, and in a second, I'll go over a few things about syntax. Uh, da -da. So does the last method one execute? Uh, I don't understand the question, Jen. Line 25 through 29. Uh, da, 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 line 25 through 29. This is a method one. Um, and this code, because this code is outside of main, see how it's outside of main? This code by default never executes. It'll, it's only capable of being executed or executed when it's invoked externally. Um, so you see right here how we're calling method one multiple, multiple, multiple times. I can go ahead and hit F5 and you see that method one gets invoked this many times, which is gonna be 10 plus one, two, three, four, 14 times. So we can reuse this code over and over and over again wherever we want, which is very, very handy. Okay, so a bunch of people asked, um, is it necessary that because method one is defined in the same class that we have to qualify it with the class name? And the answer is no. Um, if, I wanna, if I wanted to, I can go ahead and remove the program reference to all of these method ones, and this code will still work properly. Um, I just wanted to point out that, that method one is in program, and this is how you execute a method from another, inside of another class. But if it's inside the same class, the C-sharp compiler is smart enough to see that method one is in scope, meaning method one is accessible without having to fully qualify it. Um, just like program is accessible without having to fully qualify console application one dot program. If I wanted to make things very explicit, I could do console application one dot program dot method one. But because we are already in console application one, we are in this namespace. Because we're already in class program, we are in this class, none of this is required and it's all redundant information. If we were to omit it, method one would resolve correctly to the method I defined on line 26. What is the significance of namespaces? Um, I don't know how far, how much you want me to talk about that, Jason. I'm gonna let you make the call. Okay, so uh, a namespace is an organizational method. I mean, we, um, we, have, we have discussed those on day number one, so it doesn't hurt to revisit. Yeah. And solidify. Yeah, um, so namespaces are basically an organizational unit um, inside of mo many programming languages. And what that means is that, it, now in C Sharp, you, you only make types. That's really all you do. You make types and you fill it with code. Um, but you can actually place your types into another layer of organization called namespaces, where you group all of the types that you create into these namespaces that can be imported um, as a, as a group by using the using statement. So for example, you'll see here how we have using system. System is a namespace. You see how I mouse over it, it says namespace system. System has a bunch of types inside of it that we wanna use, such as console. So the organization here is that the console type is within the system namespace, we've imported it. Just like the program type is in the console application one namespace. It's generally good practice to namespace all of your types by their project name. And Visual Studio will do that for you automatically. Um, especially once you start going and sharing code or importing code from other projects, this becomes more and more important. You'll also see how we import a few other namespaces. C Sharp adds these by default because these have uh, the most common groups of functionality you might want. Uh, you, you see that we have the system collections generic namespace, um, which is going to give us things like lists, um, which we talked about last week. System.link namespace, not going to be talking about that. Um, System.text namespace um, for you know, a variety of um, different um, <clears throat> string processing uh, that we haven't really even talked about. But so link and text, uh, 
we're not going to be defining. Yeah. So yeah, namespaces are an organizational unit. If there were more classes in the code, uh, is that why you would use program to specify where the method is? Yes, if we had another class and another method on that class, in fact, I can, well. Yeah, yeah that's, that's not, let's not, let's not get that far. Um, what is it, next week or the week after, we're gonna be getting into classes. And then that's gonna make a little bit more sense then. Right now, I just, I just wanna make sure that our beginners understand the, the simple context of a method. Uh, the concept being a method is a simple way of packaging up some code that is going to perform some sort of meaningful and specific task. And so you can take that code and put it inside of a method and give the method a name that makes sense for what task is being accomplished. And that's, that's very important. For, for example, Nelson, if you were to make a method um, called, let's say, add two numbers, and this is where he's going to have to actually use some parameters, but I want you guys to get the idea of what's going on here. So it's called add, call, call yeah, okay, that's fine. Just call it add. So he's creating um, two parameters that it's going to take in, both integers, and it's going to print the result of these two numbers added together. So again, it's a, it's a very small piece of code. In this case, it's one line on line 28, so a simple statement. But the method does something meaningful, and so the name of the method uh, helps to define mentally what that method's going to be doing. In this case, add. Um, generally, I'm, I'm a little bit more specific, and, and Nelson is as well. I mean, it could be add two numbers. Um, but the idea is that we're going to send information to this method. It's going to work on that information and do something with it. In this case, if Nelson, Nelson if you could go ahead and highlight void for me. Uh, in this case, nothing is sent back from the method. But we very well could have had add, add the two numbers and send the result back. And that's a very simple example where we could have a much more complex algorithm that's within a uh, method that could take in multiple parameters, do a whole bunch of work, and return the result of that work. So Nelson, let's go ahead and call upon this method to do work. So he's going to call method, and he's going to send it two pieces of information. The two things we're going to send, 10, 12, are both integers. They have to um, conform to the data type specified in the parameters list of the method. So on line 17, int left, comma, int right. So the two things coming in, the two pieces of information coming in, must both be of type int. So that's very important. So when he runs this, so we only have line 12 and line 14 being the only statements within main. So even though we have another method titled method 1, we're not, we're not calling him, so he's not going to do anything for us. But line 12 does call add, and it sends those two pieces of information. So 10 and 12 go into left and right, those two parameters, which we can then turn around and use inside of the method, which we do. On line 19, Nelson does a console right line, and he outputs the result of left and right being added together. And we see that echoed out in the console. All right, looks like we have a few questions. Um, did, uh, is link a class? Uh, no, it's namespace. Um, is collection separate namespace than system, or it's a nested namespace? Uh, da, da, da. Everything, everything dealing with the usings, those are all namespaces. And the, the yep. moment you see a name, that's a namespace, dot, another name, that is a namespace that is within the parent namespace. So collections is a namespace within system, and generic is a namespace within collections. It is nothing more than an organizational means of keeping collections of types neatly organized. Um, console application one is not a namespace. It's simply defined by the names. I don't understand the question. Console application one is a namespace, one that we defined. Uh, or Visual Studio generated the code to define for us. 
Um, but that'll make more sense once we get to multiple types. So I don't want to talk about that too much. Um, is the first um, once we we're not going to our TJ uh, he asked uh, so in another file you could say using console app one. Um, we're not going to be talking about having multiple files yet. But, That's going to come in once we start about OOP. But the answer the is answer, yes. Yeah, the answer is yes, and sometimes no. It depends if if your other file also defines or adds to the console application one namespace, then you don't need it. But if it doesn't, then you use a using statement. <clears throat> and we will, and we will be getting to to all of that. This is a, this is where things get really interesting, and this is why I decided to push methods back so late in the um, introduction to the C sharp language, just so that our beginners get comfortable with working with if statements, while loops, for loops, switches, etc. As we work our way up to a point that now. We can take all of this logic that we can put together with the keywords that we've learned, and we can start packaging those up in methods that we can call upon to do work for us. But I've I've seen a lot of a lot of beginners get really confused with the concept of what a method is, and it gets tricky at this point because then people are going to start asking questions that you know pertain to namespaces or pertain to methods belonging to other classes because. A method is nothing but a type of member for the class in which it is in. So the add method is a member of the program class. Main is also a member. Go ahead, Ness. Well, yeah, and, and methods are basically how you add logic um, to a class. That, that's where your code comes in. The code that we've you know we've been learning how to how to use. Even even once we get into more advanced things. Uh, different shortcuts that the C sharp uh, language gives us; those are still actually technically methods. A method is where executable code goes into. So, the, all the things we've learned about thus far, such as creating variables or uh, doing uh, conditionals or looping, all of that executable code will always go inside of a method. Even if you know the C sharp language dresses it up fancy, it's still going to be inside of a method, inside of an executable context. And to answer other questions, uh, Chris asked the question, are first letters uppercased uh, in method names a general uh, convention? Yes. Yep. And Alexander says, can you – or can a method take in a method? And the answer is yes, but that gets um, – <laughs> That gets, uh, that gets fun. That gets much Very more fun. But, don't even go there. But a lot more confusing to beginners. So the answer is yes. We'll get to that not in 101, but later. Um, okay, so can we call add from method one or only from main? Good question. We could call add wherever we can access add from. And so I do want to point out one quick thing. Um, to people who might be familiar with languages like C or C++ or even uh, other languages like Ruby or JavaScript, C Sharp does not care about the order in which you define your members. Um, every member can access every other member in the same type without any sort of forward declaration. So I want to point that out. If people might be seeing this code, if they're used to C and they're seeing this code, this registers a, an error in their heads because add isn't known up until this point. But the C-sharp compiler doesn't care. Um, C-sharp compiler will allow us to reference any member from any member inside of a class. And the question was, can method one invoke add? And the answer is yes. In fact, now I could, to make things even, you know, getting things even more confusing, I can go ahead and call method one and then check this out. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and say, Start method one, end method one, start add, end add, start main, and then end main. And then hit a five, and look what happens to our execution. This is where things get really interesting. We start on main, so that means line 12 executed. Then line 13 executed, which means we go into add. Execution gets changed all the way or, or sent all the way to line 22, where we start add. You'll see that, um, that uh, output right there. Then we get the output of the addition uh, operation, and then we get end add. So that means we're on line 24 now. So now where does execution go? Well, remember that in this case, add was invoked from main 
which means that, or more specific, add was invoked on line 13 in main. So when execution resumes a main, it will resume on line 14. And what is 14? 14 is another method invocation. That method invocation will cause execution to jump all the way onto line 21, which we can see here with after add ended, we have started method one. But then we do something interesting. Inside of method one, we invoke add. And now add, uh, when we invoke add, the execution will enter line 22, which you'll see right here where we started method one and then we started add. So after we started add, we, get, we got our output 20, and then we ended add. But now where does execution resume? The ex, where execution resumes is always going to be dependent on where the method was invoked from. In this case, the method was invoked on line 30. So you'll see immediately after we hit uh, end add, we get an end method one output because execution resumed on line 31. Once the execution uh, or once uh, the method is over and there's no more executable code to actually run inside this method, it goes back to whoever called the method one. In this case, that would be main. So execution then immediately resumes on line 16, which you'll see represented right there with end main. And finally, line 17, which is the invocation of console.readkey. So, Yeah, is everybody is everybody good with the concept of the way execution works and where execution resumes after a method is immediately finished? Think of it like a hierarchy. Um, All right. This this might be a a good place to tell everybody to to do a reset and. Um, I don't, you know, people may have typed out what you did as one, um, and then the other is just coming up with, with, with a little something to try. Oh, no, I, I have something in mind. Sweet. Um, I like people getting their hands dirty. They need to. They need to really get in there and, and play with this for it to start sinking yeah. in. I, I really I, I want to define parameters a little bit more explicitly and talk about return values, but after that, I have something in mind that I think will be immediately useful and interesting. Sweet. And, so and yes, Steve, you got to type again. <laughs> So go ahead. So you want them to write this this code out? Yeah, for those for those yeah. that are are new to this stuff, they they really need to. We can't cater to the people that have experience in the class because that's not not our goal. Right. Yeah. So go ahead and get this code uh, typed out and hit your ready button when you're done. It would seem to be a good moment to mention that I have now. PM'd everybody that I have marked for week two's homework. And I shall now sit back and wait for the flood of complaining to begin. No complaining, only solutions. Actually, no, I was quite impressed with this week. There were some very, very good ones. Awesome. And there weren't any bad ones, really. There were a couple that were slightly wrong, but... There weren't anything spaghettified. Hey, nice. <laughs> are, are you talking about hanging there or bubble sort? Bubble sort. Ah. I'm going to go ahead and pause. And we are resuming. All right, so... Where's everybody at? Nelson, I can't see, unfortunately. I'm no longer considered an admin. So did everybody hit complete? Uh, about halfway through. Uh, let me go ahead and refresh to make sure that that's the latest. <coughs> and BuzzNet was running so great last week. What happened? Zach must have broke it during the... Wait a sec. I don't have my admin list anymore. So, so you're experiencing what I'm experiencing. And I never had it to begin with, but... Why? Who broke it? I just just refresh. I logged out and logged back in, and now I have my list. Uh, 
Uh, but my list, it's funny because my list is nothing but all red. So according to this, nobody's done anything. Oh, there we go. I have a list, but it's all red. Yep. Something is so broken, it's crazy. Well, that makes me feel better about my code. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have two Nelsons. Really? Yep. You, you probably do, too. What a horrible thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, I only have one. Oh, well, I have two. All right, so let's go ahead and start going forward, Nelson. Okay, so um, yes, JT actually posted a screenshot of a program. <coughs> I had considered actually making the program produce this output. But I wanted to keep things uh, very straightforward. Um, however, this output is a good visualization of what's going on. Um, so I just wanted to point that out and just say this is what's happening. The, uh, the way that the hierarchy is working with this program, how we start off with main, uh, then we start off, with, then we go into add, we print out an output, we end add. So we end add right there on line, um, line 25, and then Execution then resumes back in main on line 14. We start method one, and inside of method one, we immediately call add. And then so you see that how we, we start method one, then we start add, and how it's indented. This is a good graphical representation of what's going on, uh, because uh, you'll see that the add here is indented inside of method one, meaning when add returns, or when it uh, stops execution, uh, it's going to resume back on line 31. Okay, so is everybody good with this? Because now I'm going to move on into um, parameters and return values, uh, and then I have something in mind for people to, uh, to write. But if everybody's good thus far, then I, I can go move on. Um, I don't see any questions. Let's do it. All righty. So methods, um, they really need a way to communicate information because by default, if, if add did not take int left or int right, if, if it was just a method like method one, it, it can't do anything different. It's a really important concept of how methods work is that you need a way to sort of guide the method to perform an operation based off of uh, some values um, so that the method actually performs a computation based off of the values that you provided it rather than just statically doing something because the whole point of creating a method is to take blocks of code and create reusable, uh, just reusable things that you can use over and over and over again but you'll want to, in some way, impact how the method works by providing it information. So Jason already already talked about how, because we had this int left and int right here, how this method now takes in some data and it can perform operations on that data without having to know ahead of time what that data is. However, it's important to understand the syntax right here. The syntax right here specifies that add is a method, its, it's name is add, um, and it takes in two things in this uh, parameter list. And a parameter is a concept of a piece of information, um, a, a type of information, and a name that that information is, uh, that a method can take. So this is a very abstract concept here compared to what we've been doing before because we are defining the behavior of this add method in terms not that it already understands, but in terms that are passed in by whoever invokes it. So we start again with a type followed by identifier, followed by a comma, followed by as many other types and identifiers and commas as we need in order to uh, represent the information that add or any method requires in order to perform an interesting result. So you'll see that now that int left and int right are taken in as parameters, um, we can then use them within the method of the body however we want. In this case, we are adding them. If I were to write another method such as static void multiply, I could take an int left, int right, and say console right line output left times right. 
So I just wrote another method that takes in two integer parameters um, and performs a different interesting operation on them. So I just, you really need to understand these parameters. Um, again, I'm not talking about invocation yet. I'm literally just talking about the definition of a method right now. And when talking about the definition of method, a method contain, has these parameters that we can use just like normal variables inside the body of the method. Now, when this becomes interesting is at the call site. And a call site of a method is when that method gets invoked by another method. So you'll see in uh, multiply, there's no call site for multiply right now. But if I were to go ahead and add one, if I were to say multiply, not multitask, cast delegate, of course, um, two and two, now I'm doing something interesting here. I'm saying invoke the met method multiply. But notice, notice when, we, when we open up our parentheses, we, we get the signature. And I've talked, I've said the word signature a lot of times, but a signature is going to be the uh, kind of what defines the method or, or what the signature contains the information we need to know in order to properly invoke the method. Now, if your method requires two parameters of a particular type, when invoking the method, you must supply values for those parameters. These values are called arguments. So at a method call site, we must supply the arguments that fulfill the type requirement of the parameter. In this case, it is two integers, as you see right here. If I were to simply invoke multiply without passing in arguments, I would get an error. It says no overload from method multiply takes zero arguments. If I were to provide one argument, let's say two, we'll get another error. No overload from method uh, multiply takes one arguments. If we were to go ahead and say 43, at this point that this code will compile because the arguments we provided fulfill the requirements of the parameters of the method. And these values then get packaged up and sent to the method where, so in this case, the constant two and the constant 43 both satisfy um, the type of integer. They are um, the same type. Uh, there's, no, there's no conversion required. And they will be, when, method, when the method multiply executes here on line 32, left and right will contain the values, just like normal variables, they'll contain the values that we specified as arguments. If I were to say 2 and 43 in strings, I'll get a different error though. You'll see that the best overload for method match, or best overloaded method match for multiply has some invalid arguments. What this is saying is that 43 is a type string. String is not assignable to integer. Therefore, this is an error. Uh, simply because uh, in much the same way I could not do int left equals 43, this would be an error. So would this, because the parameters of the method will define the types that, the, uh, that, that you must specify the arguments as. So again, by passing in 2 and 43, where we are providing arguments into the method or into the multiply method that take the form of parameters or, or that took the form of parameters when we defined the method. As you can see, this gives us some really interesting capabilities because now we can reuse the same block of code and provide as many different arguments as we want as long as they conform to the types of argument or types of parameters and the amount of parameters that this method requires. So update your two methods, your add and multiply, make it look a little bit more interesting just to say um, output colon and then have um, left and right be converted over to strings with a plus and then the multiplication between it. Especially since like on the multiply line you're sending in multiple things. Are you gonna let him talk about string dot format? No, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, it's killing me too. But I get, I get where Jason's coming from. Yeah, so do I. It's just I, I haven't got used to it. I find it really hard to read <laughs> long concatenated strings and args. Oh, uh, you did the wrong one, Nelly. It should change the. Ah. Oh. Uh. There you go. And Beth it equals. Thank you. See, I was getting confused too because of the lack of format. <laughs> Um, okay, we'll talk about parameter names in a second here. That's a good question. Okay, so now you'll see that um, the output of multiply is going to be, well, I can go ahead and make this look better. Make it an X with some spaces in between there. An X, really? A little lowercase X. 
or bubble case. However, try it. Ah, uh, elementary school. It looks fantastic. <laughs> okay, so now we have output 2 times 43 equals 86, blah, blah, blah. Then we have the output of add 10 plus 12 equals 22 and so on. So you can see that we can use these parameters um, in our methods however we want. And when we invoke the method and provide arguments to the method, those parameters then get filled with whatever value we passed in. Now we had a question coming in. Um, does the, do the parameters have to be named left and right? The answer is no. If I were to change these uh, names, the identifiers of the parameters to blend wo, uh, because identifier, the names of the parameters are arbitrary, um, you'll see that I now get a bunch of errors. Left and right are no longer defined. So if I go ahead and do da 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 now the method will behave exactly like it did before, simply because I've changed the names from uh, left and right to blend whoa. Now, I, I like using left and right for, um, for these types of methods, uh, because I think they make more sense when you talk about a binary operation. But uh, the names of your parameters are arbitrary and completely up to you, as long as they're valid identifiers. Can you use the keyword var in a method declaration? No, you cannot. This is impossible. And the reason why this is impossible is that the c -sharp compiler has no way to immediately determine, as of this definition, what type that bless should be. The only way for it to determine what type bless should be is if it were to look at the call site and uh, perform some you know, more intelligent uh, inference. But c -sharp compiler doesn't do that. That's not to say that this sort of thing is not technically possible, because it is. F-sharp does do that sort of level of craziness. But in C-sharp, it is not possible. Um, a very straightforward rule. You cannot use implicit typing when dealing with parameters, period. Uh, da -da -da. <laughs> this and that. If I have a this, few of that this. and that this is equal to this, <laughs> this and that, that. How do you pass arrays into methods? Good question. Or I don't know. Like that. You'll see that the type, uh, remember that array is a type. And it's, it, it is a kind of special type because um, it has some significance to the C sharp compiler itself. But it is a type, meaning that this being a type, we can use it as the type of parameter. We can use it wherever a type is required. We can use this type. And that includes method parameters. Um, remember also that. This is also valid because list of string is a type. So we can use it in place of our types for our parameters. Is it okay if I pass like in C++ int our box int? Uh, so he's asking if we could do something like items int count of items. Um, that's just silly. Um, in C++, there's no way to determine the length of an array at runtime. Um, so you have to do this sort of stuff with C++. But in C Sharp, because you have a length property, um, it's not required. The length is a part of the array object. I would not recommend do it or supporting this sort of syntax. In fact, I wouldn't even recommend using arrays as parameters in the first place and instead prefer to pass in a list. Any generic type can be used. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to, simply because the word generic um, has significance in the C-sharp language, and I don't know what you mean. So you, OK, so are you asking if you can do this? You cannot. Although list um, is a type, 
um, uh, list of T is a type, uh, you can actually use it in the case of, um, of, a, of a parameter without specifying the type argument uh, that list requires to be referenced. Referenced. Okay, so he's asking, can you do this? And the answer is yes. Once we satisfy the type argument into the list type, uh, we can use it as the type of our parameter. Is there any more like that? I'm not sure I understand. Are you asking, are there any more types that accept types as arguments? Um, if, if you mean, are there any other, no, like generic typing. Generic typing. <laughs> type, I'm confused. T-type. T-type. Um, I mean, it, you, you can use any type here. Um, and the, like, for example, we haven't talked about this, but there's another similar generic type called ienumerable uh, that we could use. Um, so I, I, you can use any anything that you could you could uh, use as a variable um, type, you can use as a parameter type. Now there are ways in the C-sharp language to make it so you don't have to specify a type parameter as um, I do here, but we're not talking about yeah, as a and Yeah, this is getting way beyond Yeah, me, as but. A and Rico said already, please keep it simple. And, and I agree. The, but the bottom line is you can basically send pretty much anything to methods, but some of it gets a little more interesting and complicated, which we'll be talking about in later classes. Yeah, later courses. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, classes. So, all right, let's go ahead and... Uh... Let's do return. I think that would be a... Yeah, because you've already used it a couple of times. Yep. Okay, so we've talked about parameters. I hope everybody's good with parameters um, up until this point. Uh, parameters are simply ways to pass some data into a method. But methods can also return a value. And that's what I have highlighted right there. Um, remember that the anatomy of a method definition is going to be your modifiers, followed by a return type, followed by an identifier, followed by your parameter list. Now, the return type right here um, is void. And void has special meaning in the C-sharp language. Void means that this method is not capable of returning any information. The method invocation that you see right here um, doesn't actually evaluate into a value. Now, remember how we've done this before? We can take the value of console.readline and store it into a variable. That is because the signature of console.readline has a string return type. That means that the invocation of console.readline evaluates into a string value that can be assigned to a string variable. Have you actually when, mentioned about how the, the reading those tooltips? You what? About actually reading those tooltips and, and what comes in what order. Yeah, um, it's in this case, it's just going to be uh, the return type followed by the class name, followed by the method name, followed by its parameter list. Um, so you'll see in the case of console.writeline, console.writeline returns nothing. It's a method called writeline on the class of console, and it can take in a variety of things. And, and we'll talk about how to actually get this to work, but in this case, this is the overload we're using um, because this method returns nothing. Its name is writeline. It's a member of console, and it takes in a single string value. Okay, so um, so as long as a method returns something, you can have a variable equal to that method when using it in computation. Well, yes, but the reason you can do so isn't isn't this isn't a magical line of C sharp um, that's built right into the language specification. Um, all this is is simply an expression right here that evaluates into a value, and that value is of type string. Therefore, we can assign it to string variables or we could pass it directly into other methods that accept strings as parameters, or we could do absolutely nothing with the result if we wanted to. 
Remember, don't think of this as anything special or magical. This is simply an expression that returns a value. And the reason it returns a value is because it's specified right here that it returns a string. So to actually go about making methods return stuff, what we can do is instead of having the return type of void, we can specify any type that we want, any type. And that's going to include array types. That's going to include generic types. Um, any type that we want. In this case, I'm going to switch this over to an integer. I'm, I want our add method to return an integer. But you'll notice a, a, an error when we switch over from void to int. Um, the error says, not all code paths return a value. We haven't, we, we've said that this method must return an integer, but we, at no point have we actually supplied the value that it returns. We supplied that value with the return keyword, not surprisingly. The return keyword is going to be, in the case of everything except for a method that returns void, which I'll talk about in a second, the return keyword is simply the word return followed by an expression that has the value of the type that we are returning out of this method. So in this case, I can return any expression that evaluates into an integer, such as 2, such as 2 plus 2, such as 2 plus 2 times 3, such as int dot parse 1, 2, 3. <laughs> any expression that evaluates into an integer, I can supply to the return. And the return is going to take this value, package it up, and send it all the way back up to whoever called this method. Now, in this case, this obviously isn't a very useful return. Uh, to make it more um, interesting, I'm going to simply return blep plus whoa, and then I'm going to nuke all of our console right line stuff out of it. So what we've essentially done is, is instead of the add method knowing exactly what it does to the result, it doesn't know what's going to do with the result. Its only responsibility is to provide a result back to the caller, which is the kinds of methods you want to write. You want to write methods that have a very specific purpose, that take in a very specific type of parameters that it is allowed to know about, and that returns a very specific piece of data. Keeping console.write lines away from the methods that actually perform execution is very important, um, especially when you get into larger applications where you might want to change what happens to the results of your code without actually having to change the code itself. So in this case, add now returns an integer. So when add is invoked, um, we must supply two arguments of type int, and it's going to return the result of those two arguments being um, added together. So as you see right now, if I were to hover my mouse over this add method, um, or if I were to go into it and show the, the signature again, you'll see that signature has changed. It now returns an integer. Because this integer keyword is right here on the signature, that means that the result of invoking this method is going to be a value, and that value is going to be of type integer, and we can do whatever we want to that value. The most common thing you'll be doing is aliasing it out into a variable. So I can say int result equals add. The reason I can do this again is because this is a method invocation and because the way the signature is, as in it returns an integer, this code becomes valid because the result of an expression that evaluates into an integer is a valid assignment to an integer variable. And at this point I can do whatever I like with this variable. I can say console.writeline result is result. And if I were to run this program, you'll see I no longer get any output from add. We used to get output we don't anymore. But we see right here, result is 22. And that's um, on line 20, we have that code being actually invoked. And the result being aliased out to a variable. Uh, So is everybody kind of good with return types? I can make this code a little bit more interesting. I'm, I'm going to nuke most of it because we're getting really close to uh, something I want everybody to try to do. But let's go ahead and say console right enter a number int left equals int dot parse console dot read line and then enter another number right console right line um da 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 left plus 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 right plus equals add left and right 
So now if I run this program, I can put in three and one, and I get three plus one equals four. And the reason I get that here is because when, um, hopefully everybody is familiar with uh, lines 12 through 16 at this point, uh, we're simply asking the user for two numbers and we're not doing any input validation um, just for uh, to keep things uh, brief, but under normal circumstances, you would wanna use triparse instead. But so then on line 18, we have the result, left plus right equals, and then right here we have something interesting. We have a method invocation, uh, add left and right. But this method invocation, remember that because it returns an integer, as you see on line 23, the result of invoking it is going to be a value of type int. Meaning it's gonna be a value, it's as much of a value as if I literally had typed out the constant 30. This result of this expression happens and turns into the value of whatever we specified. So is everybody good with what I have so far, with with uh, with with integers being um, passed into a method, and with an integer result being passed out of a method? Because if everybody's good, alrighty. So I'm going to go ahead and reset. Everybody's ready. Um, or try to. Still having trouble. Yeah, I don't want to reset. It's funny, I've seen the, uh, in the logs that the reset event fired, but I'm not getting it back to my client. I'll go ahead and restart or uh, refresh my browser. Okay, so go ahead and I want you to write a guys to write a simple program um, that, well, just, just a basic calculator, but there's some very important things. I want user input to be handled by a method. This method takes in a prompt and returns an int. This method performs validation on the input and will not allow the user to exit the method unless the result is valid. Finally, it's going to ask the user if, um, okay, so then now that's a method, I want another method, I want a add method mole method, sub method, div method. And I guess I could multiply, subtract, divide. Um, okay, so when execution starts, ask the user uh, what operation they want to perform. Ask the user for input for the operations operands print the result and allow the user to exit or continue um, performing operations. So the methods I want are going to be uh, a method that takes an input um, and allows a customized prompt um, and performs validation and will not allow the user to exit unless they enter a valid number. Then I want an add method, multiply method, subtract method, divide method. And then the program itself is going to ask the user what operation they want to perform. Um, then ask them for the input, print the result, and allow them to exit or continue performing operations. Okay. I think that's too much, Jason. No, or... I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. Yeah, I am. Resumed. All right, we are resuming. So let's go ahead, everybody. Um, about 70, 75% of our students have got it. Are you going to grab someone? And no, 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 no. The... Let's, let's just do, let's just do, because this is, this is a, a bigger little application. Good job, A, Enrico. I saw you go uh, from red to green. Good job.
Alrighty, so then we need also our static int add, int left, int right, left plus right, sub mul div. and reread the prompt to remind myself what I'm doing. Um, Did you really want to use int for everything? Uh, I can't specify. Did I specify it? I was no, I didn't specify it. It was just I looked, when I looked at the divide and suddenly thought, ooh. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and throw in doubles. If you guys use dense, that's fine. Let's go ahead and do a string input equals console read line. Um, then let's say if input is empty string, then continue. Or sorry, break, which means, why well, I, I don't even know why I'm using the exit stuff anymore. Because we already talked about breaks and continues. Alrighty, so then we can get our two, uh, so our left equals prompt or get in get double input uh enter number one enter number two and i am going to use a switch here just because we haven't talked about else yet um uh Right, break. Minus da, 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 da. sub mole. No, not multicast delegate. We can definitely talk about those, but I think they're outside the scope mm, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> NATO result is is something NATO uh, um, Nelson's declared. Uh, why is it? What am I doing? Yeah, I want my string formats. Uh, then this should not be input. This should really be operation. Alrighty. Also, I know it doesn't do. I guess I can go ahead and add this just for just for clarity. If uh, operation does not equal that, and operation does not equal that, and operation does not equal that, and operation does not equal that then let's do this and let's break out 
and let's go ahead and assign this. Now, unfortunately, I do have to assign this right here. If I didn't assign this, then it's going to say that result is not definitely assigned. Um, and that's the concept we were talking about, I think, a few weeks ago, where the C-sharp compiler doesn't let you use variables that haven't been definitely assigned. In this case, we know that operation is one of these characters, and we know that... Is there any reason that, cases, as Bazakat just pointed out, is there any reason you've got two multiplications in your... Uh... You should have a plus in that first operation not equals line 34. Good eye, Bazakad. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so if the we we know that result is going to be assigned by the time it gets line 52, compiler doesn't. So we need to assign it to a default value. Okay, so if I go ahead and run this program, I can say I want um, to actually change the prompt to do a console write. Um, and then I'm going to append on that. And then I'm going to say, uh, right, and then like that. Okay. So I can go ahead and hit plus, enter number one, 43, and number two, two. 43 plus two is 45. I can say divide uh, that by this, and then I get the proper result. I can say subtract three and three, I get zero. I can say uh, multiply negative 43.4 and one. I can say add 400 and blah, 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 minus that, and I get the proper result and so on. And then I can just hit enter to exit the program. So how many people, I'm just curious, how many people got everything to work correctly? Can't divide by zero, no, you'll get an exception. But I didn't, I didn't specify to do any validation inside of the divide method, so I'm not expecting anybody to that's not too bad. I mean, I'm at uh, 92 lines. Well, I also have the prompt, so never mind. Yeah, well, for you, you could have done that. I just decided to uh, to do the operation just for this, but it's arbitrary. It could simply be the words add, subtract, and multiply. No, Wendy, you did not fail. All right, let me ask you this. For those of you that are um, for those of you that are wanting to copy this, I, I need to change the way that I'm going to do this so I'm pausing for a moment. I'm putting all hands down. Since right now, no offense, Nelson, I'm not trusting BuzzNet because it's not working right for the, um, the participation. For those of you that want to copy this out, put your hand up over in the webinar software. All right, cool. So that gives us, yeah, we've got we've got a lot of hands. So just we'll we'll work with you. Let us know over in Buzznet where you want us to scroll up or scroll down to. But let's go ahead and take just a moment and let's let's start from the top. Like Nelson's got it right here. Let's everybody go ahead and get the main part written down. Methods are so important. It's really important to understand the concept of methods. And it's not going to come to most people that are new to this immediately. It's going to take some playing with. And this is a really good example of Nelson changing the font sizes around. Now, this is a really good example of doing um, a, a meaningful application that is making use of methods. Somebody asked a good, a good question. Um, can you have a list of methods and then you choose one through four and it calls the method in that list? Yeah, that's There's doable. <laughs> of course as it's doable. As, just make sure you don't make any spelling errors at any point. Otherwise, you'll spend a week searching for bugs that don't exist. <laughs> yeah, but we're not... Uh, we, can't do delegates. Actually, I mean, if you it, you did record and put up that video that we did the introduction to delegates for, right, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's actually up another webinar style class talking about that stuff. But I would advise anybody who's a beginner to avoid that. I mean, don't worry. For those of you guys that are new and you're sticking with us, uh, you know, we're planning to take this far. And we're here for you guys. So ask questions, copy code, 
Make use of our time that we're giving you for open office hours. Learn this stuff. If you really want to learn it, we're going to do whatever we have to to make sure you learn it. And remember that MSDN is your friend. Google. Go look at F MSDN and learn your way around the site and the best way to get information out of it. In a the best way to get information out of it is to use Google to search MSDN. <laughs> there is that. In a and Rico because they, of course, use Bing to search themselves. It's best to um, it's best to put answers over in the um, or questions. I'm sorry, over in the questions panel for the webinar. Those those will get answered by us. If they're in the chat, there's no guarantee that they'll get answered. I get that question. Um, I, I get that question a lot from people, and that is, how long of a pause will there be between the 101 and 102 class? How long of a pause do you guys want? I'm only asking that because I've seen the question so much. I'm starting to get this feeling that that people are afraid to get a delay. None, zero, good. Twenty-four hours. So sorry to everybody. Sorry to everybody that because I'm I can't please everybody. Some people are telling me to scroll up. Some people are telling me to scroll down. No, no, no. Stay. I'm, Here's what I want you to do. Everyone who's got everyone who's still co top copying the top. Ah, oh, Nelson. I, I, I. That's really not helpful. No, it's not helpful to. to you're just going to confuse the heck out of some people. All right, for those everybody put. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put everybody's hand down. If you're still copying the main method, put your hand up. Okay. So let's let them finish first, and then we can scroll down to the second half once this is done. So if you've already got the top part, the main method copied, stretch, say some stuff in chat, go to YouTube, go grab some coffee. I, I am going to go ahead and pause the video real quick. So I'm resuming. All right, we had a question come in while everyone was typing this out. Uh, Barry asks, uh, can you explain how line 68 is working? So if try parse fails, it keeps looping? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, we have an uh, infinite loop right here. This loop will continue forever until either a break or a return is reached. Now, when we hit line 75, when try parse is returns true, meaning try parse successfully parsed out um, the, res the uh, input from the console into a double, it's going to return true and enter this if branch, if statement. This if statement, all it's going to do is say return result. Now, as you can see up here in these other methods, there is only one line of code, and it's the first and the last line of code, and it's just a return statement. But returns can actually be placed anywhere inside of a method. And when you hit a return, that is going to take the execution of this method and discontinue it, whether or not you're in a loop. So it's going to immediately terminate the method, even though we are inside of an infinite loop. So it would work, um, you know, if I had done this instead. Maybe this would be clearer. But what I did was essentially just shorthand for this. And whoop, TJ got it. <laughs> Screw you, go-tos. <laughs> That's the right attitude. Uh, will we cover out and ref keywords? Uh, not today. Nah. Not today, I guess. No, not today. Remember, I did do an out and ref. Uh, uh, um, you did. Um, video in the uh, C Sharp language specification uh, uh, series. All right, remember to put your hands down once you have it, and I'm going to go ahead and pause the video real quick until everyone's complete. Okay, so we're now back, and we have some more questions that have come in over on the side. Nelson, it looks. All right. Um, I, I did see your um, your question, Enrico, um, but I'm going to ask Miranda first. What errors are you getting? Bunches. I'm not familiar we, with we that can, error code. We can always uh, flip over to Miranda's screen. Yeah. Do you want us to uh, jump over? <laughs> One second. Click cleanup. <laughs> 
and yeah, we, we will be talking about the difference between break, return, and continue. Because now, well, you know, there's a little bit more context. Exactly. All right, so Miranda, just as soon as you're ready. Okay, there you go, Nelson. Da -da. Um, uh, <laughs> you okay, Nelson? There we go. Nelson is melting. We can uh, we can hear you. By the way, sounds like you have a mic. Okay. Yeah, it looks like uh, the issue is going to be on line 16. Um, when I had written the code initially, I had used uh, the variable name input, but I changed it to operation because that made more sense. Um, so if you change line 16 to operation, um, you're also going to have to fix your, your casing on line 17, 22, and so on and so on. And then that'll make that code work. Um, yeah, sorry about flipping. I do tend to. <coughs> okay. Okay, so changing the lowercase to the uppercase. Yeah, I could see that. It, it wouldn't surprise me if there was something called operation that IntelliSense wanted you to use. Um, then on line 24, um, definitely look at uh, look at that plus right there. And remember what right line is. It's a method. There you go. And <laughs> nice, but you, you, it's still a derp. Just one more There's thing. One more thing. Remember, you have to tell it. Oh, what, oh, yeah. Oh. All right. And in addition, you could also display the operation that the user tried to input. Right. Now think about what variable contains the operation that there you go. Yeah. There. Nice. Sweet. All right. Um, what's the, uh, could you put your mouse over line 28 on the squigglies? No, nah, there's just the squiggly. Um, oh, okay. So if you scroll down, uh, I did, <laughs> if you scroll all the way down to uh, the uh, method down there, um, the definition of that method, or the supposed definition of that method. Scroll down. Okay, the uh, the name. Um, I changed it from get int input to it get double input because now I'm returning a double. So if you just change the name on line sixty eight to get double input. Ah, uh, right. Sorry about that. I love how awesome your sentences <laughs> read with the help of IntelliSense. I typed some of this out of memory exception before you changed it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's just no, no, um, no. It's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Go ahead and take the word uh, or the part int out right before the on line sixty-eight. Still, see right there. It's looking for the method get double input, but uh, int is still in there. So you still have get int. Yep, there you go. Perfect. All right. Now let's scroll back up. Sweet. Um, so if you do, if you hover over the squiggly on line 34, best overload has, oh, um, if you go back down to, I changed all the types of the methods to double instead of int. Miranda's going to punch you in the nose in a minute, Nelson. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. So all of the uh, all of the types just yeah double click and copy double. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's talking about the methods between line forty eight and sixty six. Just change all those ints to doubles. And the easiest way between, to do it is uh, just double click and copy and paste, so you don't have to type it all. Or do that. Or or that. Ch 
change the requirements frequently while nobody's looking. Yeah, again, I apologize. Uh, generally, when I'm when I'm coding, uh, you're also going to have to uh, change the types of the parameters as well. Watch this. Let me let me show you something. Put your mouse over one of the double returns. The word double. Um, I, I, wait, wait, wait. Let's, let me. I want to show you this. Now, now, put your mouse over the. Now, double click. With your mouse over the word double. Now, double click. Now, Control C. Now, put your mouse over int. And double click on int. And control V. Um, there you go. Now just double click, control V. Double click. Yeah. Look, oh, man, look at the speed. That's what I'm talking about. Up, up. All right. Things are cleaning up. Yep. And we're missing so one there's... more. We're missing one operator on line 40, and we'll be in good shape. And I'll give you a hint. It's right before the word right. R-I-G-H-T, that right. Yeah, huh, 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 wait, ah, uh, yes! Dun, 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 dun. It's like victory music or something. So if you uh, hit control, or if you hit F5, you should get a running program. Good evening, James. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit converter. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. Unfortunately, Miranda, where are you? Uh, where are you at? Out of curiosity. Oregon. Oh, cool. Mm. Very cool. <laughs> Earth. <laughs> well, thank heavens. I was afraid for a minute you might be from Mars with all that lag going on. Now that is an error. In case you want to take out the double quotes. <laughs> That'll change soon. You planning to move to Mars? All right, just kidding. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue. <laughs> now go ahead and go ahead and uh, run and make sure it works. Up. Aww. So that's okay. Hit. Um, so hit no. Double click. Oh, we're gonna have an extra. Speed of light there. So let's give it a try. Did we? Oh, we're deep. Uh, the there's uh, the uh, the doohickey thing is up at the top. All right, there you go. Hey, nice. that's good. So let's do a little, all right. Nice. That's wrong. Did I forget how to um, subtract? No. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And Nelson, if you want to pull back over to your screen. Awesome. And thanks for working with us, Miranda. You did great. All right, Nelly. All righty. So. 
So I guess it's time to actually talk about this code. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, um, when we enter main, I open up an infinite loop um, because I, I want this program to continue to uh, perform the same actions until the user specifies that they want to quit. I prompt the user um, for what operation they want to perform, and then I grab it and I alias that into a variable called operation of type string by assigning it to console.readline. I check to see if they just hit enter. Remember, if they just hit enter, operation will be an empty string. And if they do, I break out of the program. So the program is, is done executing. Um, well, it's technically not done executing. It just exits this while loop, which then processes a console.read key and then exits the program. Then I validate their input by making sure they typed in one of the predefined operators, so plus, minus, uh, multiply, divide. And if they didn't, I tell them that they were stupid and I continue, which means I'm going to stop executing this iteration of the loop and I'm going to continue all the way at the start again and redo the entire program. Now, if we get to line 20, 28 here, we know that they have entered a proper operation um, as I, any of those four symbols. So we can go ahead and start using the methods that we put together. So the first method <clears throat> I want I wanted to have our input be validated properly, but I didn't want to write this code over and over and over again. So what I did was I abstracted it into a method. And I did so by identifying what parts of the method need to change depending on who's calling it, in this case, the prompt, which takes the form of a string parameter. And finally, what type of data is going to be returned by this method uh, once it successfully executes. In this case, it's going to be a double. So then I enter another infinite loop. Um, where I continuously prompt the user for uh, some sort of data. Remember, the prompt is irrelevant to the method itself. It's defined by whoever calls it, meaning we can reuse this method in a lot more different cases. Then I simply do a double dot try parse, pass in console dot read line. And if this, method's, if this method call succeeds, it'll return a true. And if it returns a true, we enter the if statement, we return our result. If it returns false, we do not enter the if statement block, and we continue iterating um, or executing this loop in this next iteration, which case we'll prompt the user again, get the result. If it's valid, we'll return it. Otherwise, we'll continue and continue and continue and continue. So once we've done this method twice, so that's that's the power of methods right here. We were able to use this, this same piece of code twice given a different prompt, and we were able to get a result back from it. Then I uh, create another variable and assign it to zero. The reason I assign it to zero isn't arbitrary at all. It's because if I did not assign it to zero, the C-sharp compiler would not know that it's definitely assigned and throw an error when I tried to reference it. Then I switch on the operation. So in the case of them entering a plus, I um, set the result to the invocation of add given the pr pr arguments left and right. And remember, left and right are the two variables that got returned from the get double input method. If it's uh, subtraction, we simply set the results to the subtract method. If it's multiplication, we set the results to the multiply method. If it's division, we set the results to the divide method. Now, these individual methods, very straightforward. Each method takes in two double parameters and returns a single param double uh, result. And they're all one-liners. So double add, uh, double left, double right, <clears throat> returns left plus right. Subtract returns left minus right. Multiply returns left uh, times right. And divide returns left divided by right. Very straightforward methods. And that allows us to you know, clean up this code. And you know, maybe addition wasn't built into the C-sharp programming language. So maybe this code was you know, 2 billion lines long um, for whatever reason. Um, with aliasing the amount of methods or, or, or create abstracting the amount of methods, we now do not care necessarily about the implementation of what constitutes addition. We just care that some other piece of code knows how to do it for us. So we get a very nice, clean, straightforward switch uh, statement that allows us to uh, continue on uh, executing our code without actually knowing the intimate details of how our other pieces of code um, operate. At the end of this, uh, result was set to something. Uh, the reason that's logically true is because if operation was not in this whitelist of characters, 
um, then it was already, uh, the loop was already uh, continued on line 25. So we know at this point operation is set to something. So we can simply say left, uh, we can write out left plus operation uh, plus right equals result. Very straightforward. And then we continue the loop and continue the loop, continue the loop, continue the loop until the user inter, uh, just hits the enter key because that would result in an empty string and we break out of the loop, which would result in main uh, invoking console.read key and then the program terminating. Okay, so um, I will show this one last time. <laughs> Sorry, the question came in in all caps. Um, the, uh, this method is going to um, take in a string prompt and return a double. So that's the most important thing about uh, uh, at least reading the signature is you, you got to know what the method takes in, what it returns, and then of course its name, get double input, uh, should be fairly straightforward. Now it enters in an infinite loop. So this loop will continue to execute code um, until the uh, loop is either broken out of or returned from. Um, so you'll see we continue to loop, continue to loop, continue to loop until the result of double dot try parse, this method invocation returns true. And this method invocation is only going to return true when double dot try parse is capable of taking the console, the result of console dot read line and turning it into a double variable for us, which it sets into the result variable. If this is true, we return result. This means we take execution and we stop it for this method. And the method immediately terminates. Uh, and the result of invoking the method becomes whatever we returned. Because this happens, this ignores loops. The return statement does not care about loops. It does not care about indentation or any other construct of the language. It will just stop the method period, dead in tracks, no more method. So that's how the return works in this case. Um, and I, I hope that that is straightforward. Did I answer your question, TJ? Cool. All right, sweet. Uh, okay, so, da, da, da. so that bool never becomes false. Oh no! It, it, this this boolean right here. This is a constant. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's it's a literal. Yeah, um, and if the C sharp language specification called for the literal true returning the value false, I would <laughs> die. Walk over to Redmond and burn their offices down. Don't, don't so, admit that we're recording, is, Nelson. In case oh, in right. case they burn down tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so while true, um, true is a constant that always has the result of true or the value true. It never becomes false ever. Um, what happens is, is when the double dot try parse returns true, this if statement is executed. And when this if statement is executed, we return result, meaning we halt the ex we don't halt. We stop the execution of, uh, this method and we go back to the caller, regardless of how many loops were nested in. So does that make sense, Nato? Sweet. Okay, so at this point then, are there any other questions that you saw? I think we're now looking pretty good. So now let's... Uh, we did get a question actually that I, I was meaning to answer but I forgot about. Um, how would you parse and calculate everything from one input string, string i.e. one times two? <laughs> That's see, I was funnily enough when you set the project, I was expecting you to be talking string concatenation and substrings and similar. Nah, well, that that brings in a whole thing of parsing, yes, um, yes. which is a very big thing. Yeah, that. Yeah. No, we're. I mean, if you're in the MMO, you you can uh, check out the antler stuff. Uh, that'll that'll teach you how to actually uh, understand that um, type of. <laughs> Syntax. That'll teach you to ask difficult questions. <laughs> um, it's not as easy as you think, by the way. Like when I when I started programming, I always assumed that that um, string parsing was trivial, but it really isn't. 
So let's um, the uh, next thing I wanted you to go ahead and talk about was just now we can we can put meaning behind the word local scope for variables. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure they have a, a clear understanding of of how variables defined within or declared within a method are local to ju just that scope. I'm gonna go up and fire up another project for that because okay. I don't want to in, in case people want to jump back into uh, that code. I don't want to. Mingle. Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to do this. Ready for this? Okay, so what's the output of this program, everybody? Sorry, I had to jump into Notepad, but I didn't want any cheating from. Nope. Uh, yeah, from Visual Studio itself. So we have. Um, a little bit of back I, and forth between error, error nothing. nothing, zero, will not compile, I is not defined in the scope, I does not exist, what the heck is I for print I, error I not available. But what the heck is I for print I is um, print I just happens to be the name of the method. Yeah. Uh, 42, um, <laughs> closest answer. <laughs> yeah. Applejack. <laughs> Hunter. You can actually do some crazy things with JavaScript um, to get it to uh, a seeming, uh, without using anything but um, these symbols. You can get JavaScript to like actually alert out any char any string character or string that you want, as long as it contains uh, only contains letters F A L S E and T R U E. It's pretty intense. All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about what it actually is. Okay, so I'm going to close um, close this out. So we got and save it, um, and then open up in Visual Studio. We got a bunch of different answers. People said uh, it would print, print nothing. Some people said it was an error. Some people said it wouldn't compile. Uh, some people said that it was zero because their reasoning was that I uh, would default to zero. But if I open it up, we'll see the answer right away. And on line 18, we have the name I does not exist in the current context. So what this means is that this i variable doesn't actually, well, exist anywhere. Print i has no idea where i is, which is very sad for a method called print i. Um, it's not capable of reaching in into any other scope or any other method that has uh, an i declared because this, this method defines its own scope. Just like how um, if I were to do this, for example, Remember how blocks uh, define scope, and in this case, this is an empty. This is a block that's associated with nothing. But if I had something like if true, the same thing would uh, would hold, because I is never defined in the scope that line seventeen can access, because line seventeen is in, is in a parent scope, whereas I is defined in a child scope. Of course, we could simply do uh, int i and then set i to ten. That would work because I is now available to both the scope inside of line 16 and the scope on line 19. But the problem is, because methods define their own scope, there's no way for us to access the local variables of one method from another method. That's just simply impossible. Now, if I were to, uh, then the people who said that it would print out zero, you are on the right track, but in C sharp, um, unlike other languages, but in C sharp, um, it is not valid to reference a variable by a, a variable reference name. It, wow! You could do it. No, it is not. <laughs> it is not possible to reference a variable that hasn't been defined yet. 
it's not possible to reference uh, any sort of name that has no meaning prior to execution or prior to the line being executed. <laughs> I'm just going to throw you a full stop at you. Your American periods obviously aren't working properly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's what's happening here. Um, no way to reference the I variable because it is out of scope and scoping is very important. Um, also, you cannot access a variable that hasn't been defined yet. Was there anything else um, about scoping, or does anybody have any questions about scoping? Yeah, that's, that's... Uh, you said something. Go ahead. Go ahead. You said something about modifier static will make int i like public or global. Uh, we haven't talked about the static modifier at all, um, other than saying that if you do not have the static modifier. Um, your method will look like it's working just fine, but when you try to invoke it, it will be a syntax or a compile error that looks something like an object reference is required for the non-static field method or property. That's so far all we've talked about static, that if you write for now, just put it in your, your method, declare your methods as static. Does the IntelliSense make scope a telescope? I think that was an attempt at a joke. <laughs> Okay. Oh, can you declare variables with Jason's up to you? Um Hey Enrico, we'll we will get back to that. Yeah, too much for now. Is that on next week's list? Is that week six? Um without going back and looking, I'm not for sure. It'll be on one of the two. I yes, thought. yes. Okay. So, at this point, Nelson, um, the only thing left that uh, to cover everything that we needed to have covered today is method overloading. Mm, okay. And then that's it. And then to let them know what the very easy homework for this week is. Okay. Huh, easy. <laughs> it is easy. Well, don't laugh like you just probably scared half of them to death. No, I'm not saying anything. We won't talk about the homework until we get there. Okay. And so hopefully, you know, hopefully no one will die of fright after they hear what about it. What are you it. doing? All right, fine. <laughs> okay, so um, method overloading. Actually, I'm going to show you guys something cool. This is just kind of an aside, but I just want to, it'll make um, Nelson happy. Well, yeah, it'll, it'll show you guys a cool trick and it will. Is it a magic trick? Yeah, <laughs> it is a magic trick. Or will it compile? Uh, I, I just want to show people a cool trick and then um, this will actually lead into a discussion about overloading. Doing a what? Uh, what? What's going on here is important. Anyway. Okay, so what we have here is um, we're, we're using read key a little bit differently than we've ever used it before. I just wanted to point out that you can actually use it. If you do console.readkey.keychar, you'll get a character um, back that is the character that the user inputted. So you can do some really cool stuff with it. If I run this program, I can say A doing A, B doing B. Then I can type in a bunch of stuff that doesn't actually do anything. But the second I hit A, they'll say doing A, doing B. So with read key, you can get some really interesting user, um, user experiences with the console. So is everybody kind of good with what's going on with this code here? just as far as how read key returns the character that was hit. Uh, could We haven't talked about ELSIF yet. I've been, every time I have to not use ELSIF, I die a little on the inside, but I don't want, it, that syntax can be confusing and it will lead people um, to have headaches. Hmm. 
but anyway, so the point is, is console read key is a nice little function that allows us to get the key back that the user returned. So fun stuff. Now here's a problem though. Look at this. When I'm hitting A, you see that console read key is actually printing out what I typed in. If I do B, it's printing out what I typed in as well. When I do all of this garbage, it's also printing that out. What if I didn't want it to? Well, console.readkey has what's called an overload on it. Or a read, yeah, console.readkey has what's called an overload. Uh, the dot key char, uh, console.readkey actually returns an object that is a little bit less trivial than a simple character. But if you do console.readkey followed by a dot, followed by key char, this will return the character that the user inputted in the form of the character type. What will it do for uh, uh, space control uh, escape, for instance? It'll con just convert them into... Uh, yeah, it'll just convert them into ASCII characters. Okay, cool. Like I'm hitting all the function keys right now and yeah, it's printing yeah, them out of spaces. Okay, so console.readkey actually has an interesting overload. And the reason it has an overload, or the reason we can see it has an overload, is when we open up the parentheses, you see that the IntelliSense window comes up with this one of two, and these little down and up arrows. Uh, you can also use the um, up and down, care, uh, up and down um, keys on your keyboard to scroll through all these. So whenever you see that there's this little list right here that you can scroll through, what you're looking at is a list of method overloads. A method overload is another, is a distinct method that has the exact same name and a different parameter list. All a method overload is, is it's another method with the same name, different parameter list and optionally different return type. So you'll see that if we scroll down, there's another overload to this read key method with, that accepts a Boolean called intercept. And if you read uh, the documentation for it, it says determines whether to display the press key in the console window, true to not display the key, otherwise false. So instead of doing console read key, I can do console read key and pass in true. What's happening is, is this is doing performing a distinct different method invocation than if I just had done console read key. The C-sharp compiler looks at the arguments I'm passing in, and it tries to determine the best match as far as which overload to actually invoke. So when I don't supply any, any arguments, you'll see that it defaults to this overload simply because it's the best match. If I provide a Boolean argument, it'll default to this because, well, the Boolean argument matches the um, parameter. So now if I actually hit F5, you'll see that I can hit all the keys I want, but I don't get any output. But if I hit A or B, I get, you know, doing A or doing B. So what's happening here again is that console read key, this is, we're invoking a different entire method based off of whether or not we passed in a value. So at least as far as defining your own um, overloads, they're very simple. So here's a method, very straightforward. Here's another method. I was going to suggest you do exactly that, but with your divide method from the other, just because it would show different results. You what? With the divide method in your in your maths example, I was going to suggest you did a, a, a double version and an inversion. Yeah, I could do that. I was just worried about the amount of code that was already there. Okay. So does everybody kind of see what I did? I have one, two, three, four methods, and each method has a different parameter type. With this, but the same name. That's the that's the important thing. We're creating multiple my method methods. But they are just, they are um, chosen based off of what types of arguments you pass into them.
So they're entirely different methods with the exact same name, but they have a different parameter list. And in C-sharp, that's required for doing overloading. You must provide a different parameter list. If I were to give these two methods the same parameter list, such as int, you'll notice that I get an error. In a second, there we go. We get uh, program already defines a member called my method with the same parameter types. So we have to make sure that we differ by our parameters. What if you had it an int, but uh, it was a static int method, for instance? Oh, you mean overloading based off return? Hmm. I can never remember whether that works or not. Yeah, it's, there's actually a funny thing behind that. So let's say we have two methods that have the same name, but differ based off of return type. And look at this. We get an error. Or, of course, we get an error. <laughs> there we go. We get a different error. Uh, type uh, already defines a member called stuff with the same parameter types. So you cannot overload based off of uh, return types. But here's the, here's the funny thing. You can in IL. Um, the actual CLR will let you do this. The C Sharp language itself will not let you do this. But if you actually wrote methods in IL, you could overload based off return. Hmm. I just think that's kind of funny. Because in IL, when you invoke a method, you have to give its entire signature, including the return type. But in C Sharp, there's no way for the, well, there could be a way for the compiler to infer your, what the return type should be, but it, that would just be way too complicated. Fair enough. So now if I go ahead and type in my method, you will see we get this little list again, just like what we saw with console read key, just like what we see with console write line. And you see if I pass in an integer literal, that's valid. If I pass in a double literal, that's valid. If I pass in a float literal, that's valid. I should probably just change the value. Uh, wow. Yeah, that made it a lot clearer. Um, and then if we pass in a Boolean literal, we get that. So now if I run this program, you'll see something cool. The c -sharp compiler determined which one of these methods to invoke based off of how well it could match your argument list to your parameter list. So in this case, completely distinct methods were invoked, even though they have the same name, and the call sites look very similar. The difference is, is that the c -sharp compiler was able to determine which one of these overloads should be executed given the val or the type of the value that was passed in as the argument. So any questions? Uh, why would we want to do method overload? Wouldn't it be confusing? Well, that's a good question. Um, a common one, actually Gav, I, I'll, I will type out what Gav was suggesting. Um, a second ago, because I think that's a good example. Uh, so do I. Okay, so in this case, we have two div methods, or maybe, see, I, I always just do div, but for sake of everybody else, we'll do divide. Um, so we have two divide methods, one that takes in two integers, and one that takes in two doubles. So now if you had double variables um, and you tried to divide them, you would get this implementation. If all you had were integer variables, however, you would get this implementation. Can you just do um, a console at right line divide five and two as ints and then as floats? So in this case, this divide divided five and two, but as integers. So it invoked the uh, method I declared on line 23, which treated these as integers. And remember, integers cannot have a decimal component. On line 18, however, I passed them in as double literals by adding the D suffix to them. As a result, the divide method that I declared on line 28 was invoked. And you see that we, st we get the proper precision. Not only that, if I were to hover my mouse over this divide, you would see the signature is int, divide, int, left, int, right. If I were to hover my mouse over this invocation, I would get double divide, double left, double right. 
Now, what happens if you do the same line again, but with five... In, you know what I'm going to say, as an int. And two as a double. Um, at this point... Just assume that's a double. Yeah, Jen, there, <clears throat> this gets into a very, very complicated section of the specification that determines uh, overload resolution. Um, and it becomes very... go with more precise in this case. Yeah, it'll tr it'll generally default to going as precise as it can. Um, it, the C# -sharp compiler will try not to lose data because if it passed this into the integer version, it would have lost data. Okay, cool. I don't want to go too far beyond what you. I, I don't, it's I don't just it, 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 as it, as you are passing it, the whole int division thing is a yes. good way to get very very odd errors to find. Yeah, I haven't I, I haven't even memorized the 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 specification on operator over or method overloading because it's it is very convoluted when you get into edge cases like this um okay so there's another example of when you would want to use method overloading such like static int uh get int from console string print prompt i'm just gonna cheat i'll be right back Okay, so we have this awesome git double double uh, input method, but you know, what if we didn't want to have to provide a value for the string prompt argument every single time we invoked it? Operator overloading gives us the option to provide another implementation that does not take in any arguments. So the reason this works is because, and it's erring because I'm not returning anything, not because the signature is incorrect. Um, the reason this works is because the, this method does have the same name, but it has a different parameter list. In this case, the method has a string prompt parameter, and in this case, this has no parameters. So what I can simply do is say return get double input, enter a double. So now when I invoke this code, I have two options. I can provide nothing, or I can provide a prompt. In the case that I provide nothing, the default prompt is going to be used because of the way I set up the code. Enter a double. So it's not it's not required that this method is written in terms of this method. For example, I could have just as easily have done this. If I wanted to. Um, these methods are simply bound because they have the same name. So they allow you, you can overload depending on whether or not you want to pass in a string or not. But in this case, it generally always is better to write one method in terms of another. So the, the least specific methods are written in term of, terms of the most specific methods. So it would definitely be preferable to write this implementation in terms of the other one. That particularly happens if you start getting into, into, into 3D like graphics operations, because if you're calculating um, doing something like uh, quantizing a vector, um, and you can write a float quantize method and then just call it for each for the x, y, and z of the vector. And just as an example. Yeah, definitely when you start working with different types, different precisions of types, overloading becomes very important. All right, anything over in the questions panel? Uh, ta -da. So it's just more flexible. Yeah, it's just another tool. Uh, remember, the entire C# -sharp language is just a bunch of tools you can use to express yourself, and this is one of one of the ways that you can use to express either default arguments or arguments of different types. Um, because in some cases, certain logic is appropriate for a certain type, but not for another type. And if you wanted to write a method that was flexible enough to actually be capable of understanding two different types of arguments, you could do so using overload. Streeter, Miranda, I saw a sigh, yet another video I'm going to have to rewatch. If you have any very specific questions or anything you're confused about, let us know. Uh, a little beyond the scope, but how do overloads deal with predefined variables passed in? I'm not sure what you mean. Are you referring to constant values? Uh, 
as in the variable type var. Oh, so you are you asking something like if I did var left equals get double input, um, var right equals get double input, and then finally console.writeline divide left and right. Are you referring to something like this? Um, in this case, um, remember that var is still compile time and it's still the exact equivalent um, of you specifying the type explicitly. In this case, because get double input returns a double, the C sharp compiler sees that you are assigning an implicitly typed variable to a method invocation that returns a double. And it's going to know to make this var a double. So type inference has no effect on overloading whatsoever uh, because type inference is only really valid or the, the, the concept of type inference. You couldn't, you, couldn't use, you couldn't do that if you were using your divide method though, presumably, instead of get double input. I don't know what... I'm confused. Would that... Actually, I'm confused now as to whether it would work or not. If you had var right equals divide 5, 2. Oh, that would work as well. That would work. I thought it would, and then I thought I thought wrong. This would work because these have been typed... Uh, see, this gets very, very <laughs> confusing, but these get typed as doubles. As a result, the C-sharp compiler knows which overload to use. Even if I had used, uh, if I did this though, then it will be an int. If I do this, then result will be a double. Because at compile time, the compiler knows the value or the type of every expression and can determine which overloads to use. So is everybody good on overloading? Because this is this is really going to pretty much wrap things up. I don't want um, at this time, Nelson. Since we were just adding it as um, extras, uh, well, uh, Florum just asked, but we were adding the uh, the default parameters and and all as as extra stuff. Let's let's just keep it simple to this for today. Alrighty. Um, because there are a lot of considerations you have to keep in mind when using exactly. them. Exactly, and I would, I'd rather not convolute everything. That's why originally it was left out, and we talked about it before class. It was like, yeah, we could go ahead and throw that in, but, you know, I would prefer that we go ahead and leave that out right now because it was designed not to. Um, yeah. I'd rather people just get a good solid grasp on, you know, just the use of methods in general. Yeah. I wonder how many aggregate migraines were caused um, in the uh, C-sharp team when they wrote C-sharp 4, <laughs> because default and named arguments combined with dynamic typing, pretty <laughs> much pretty much those things alone account for like 75% of the complexity of operator or uh, member resolution, <laughs> method resolution. I, I would not like to be on that team during that time period. Yeah. <laughs> I would die. So if you want to go ahead and talk about homework, it actually is pretty simple this week. I was trying to keep them on their on the edge of their seats. Well, yeah, but now we're at the end of the day, and <laughs> you've already got some people quite right. exhausted. So, <laughs> Okay, so the, the goal of the homework is to rewrite um, the hang in there application. Um, if you haven't submitted it yet – wait a second. If you haven't submitted it yet, haven't you missed the deadline? Technically, yes. Gavin, help me. No, the deadline oh. is Wednesday. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Day after tomorrow. Okay, so if you haven't finished your the, or submitted your homework yet, don't worry about doing this yet. Submit it without the modifications for this homework. Um, but the goal of this homework is to rewrite your hang in there application in terms of methods. So the goal is to get your code as clean as possible, to read as clean as possible, and to get repeated chunks of code um, refactored into their own methods uh, with the appropriate uh, parameters and appropriate return types. 
So it's basically just cleaning up the code, um, making it read better, and making it, uh, well, less by taking common, commonly used pieces of code and organizing them into methods. And we just felt that it would be, yeah, basically you're going to be doing a refactor. Uh, you want to explain we that? Give some sort of special prize for the shortest. Uh, <laughs> you want to explain that, Nelson? Class. Refactoring what the word means. Yeah, the word refactor simply means modifying your code in such a way that the out, the result of your code doesn't change. Um, and the goal of refactoring is to make code cleaner um, or more maintainable, or possibly faster, or more or consume less memory. But the goal of a refactoring is to not change the behavior of your program. It's to achieve some other goal by keeping the behavior the same. Uh, most commonly, the goal of refactoring is to make ugly code clean. Um, it's a really useful skill to learn early on, I've decided. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and the problem with refactoring, though, is when you're in the process of refactoring, you are going to be slinging code everywhere. And I, I do want... And things won't... I do want to address something else real quick, and that is Flora Mass and a couple other people are now starting to ask, you know, if we already use methods, can we have another homework assignment? And the answer is no, and here's why. I, I tried to make this as clear as possible at the very beginning of the course is we're, we're catering to those that truly are new to C Sharp. That's where our focus needs to be. And if you already did a... Um, an assignment with using methods and all that's fantastic but that also your skill set is a little bit ahead of of where it needs to be or with some of you guys it's a lot ahead of where you need to be um, for, for this particular class so I don't want to bog uh, Gavin down having to worry about other kinds of assignments coming in uh, because that'll just make things a lot messier I mean, this 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 is a beginner class. Is, I mean, if you if, if, if somebody was to jump back, if, if if somebody was to jump back what? into like kindergarten or first grade, and then and they have all the experience all the way up through college, and then you know the teacher's like, okay, for your homework assignment, you need to spell these little three letter words, you know, and but can, you know, it's like, oh, can you can you give me a a much more complex you know homework assignment because you know that's that's old school, it's, you know, we're trying to keep this class as a 101 class, it wouldn't make sense. But, I mean, fear not, when we get up. There will be harder stuff yeah, ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the one thing, uh, I've forgotten what it was I was going to say related to that. Ah, oh. wow, I haven't done that in a few months. Haven't done what in a few months? I just lost completely what I was going to say. <laughs> I've come close, but no, um, but um, yeah, anyone who who did um, because there were there was one at least that springs to mind that was very nice, tidy. I think there were about three or th three or four methods. Um, please do resubmit it. Um, just logistically, yeah. I I don't want to see anyone saying, "Oh, I'm just." Could you just look at my? previous week's homework I know from your end that would be easier but from my end that would that's just causing another chance for me to lose track of who's handed what in when to what so um, make sure you update the names to things properly yeah exactly and actually as a quick shout out to everyone you've got uh, when it comes in uh, you get this namespace with your with your name uh, and I'll say that again if you if your namespace that you i.e. the um, solution name that you give to your solution is as is your username underscore week four um, that will that will already set you up with things named semi correctly but if everyone who feels like it could uh, name their rename their program class and their program file to their username as closely as possible of course as closely as possible I was going to say this um, uh, Visual Studio will tell you if you if your username c contains any uh, characters it doesn't it won't allow you'll get to just get red, red squigglies. Um, could you just type in an example? Well, your username, for instance, Nelson, wouldn't work. Because you've got uh, yeah. And uh, then even if I didn't have that, spaces are invalid. So in this yes. case, write it something like you know. Like that, or underscore week four. 
That's right. Yeah. And then, um, but your program, your actual class program needs to be named, yeah, basically that, and so does the program.cs file. The easiest place to do that is in Visual Studio as well. If you do this, and then just zip up your .cs file and send that, you will successfully <laughs> submit your homework, provided you get the subject line right. <laughs> Because that's all I'm using to check the homeworks is that CS file, and I, and I've basically been having to rename them myself because I've ended up with 90 pro program .cs files. Uh, that's uh, that will make the turnaround very much quicker for the half dozen or so of you who have been eager for updates on their homework. Cool. All right. Well, Nelson, is there? Yeah, no slim, no CS proj. I was going to say, Nelson, if there's anything else that. Uh... No. I mean, we can talk about generic methods. No, no, no. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> now, I think that's going to pretty much cover everything that we set out to cover today. Um, and uh, did you see that what just came across from Florum? Gavin over in BuzzNet chat. Gavin. Sorry, he's muted. Can I talk about your homework too? Um, I could. What, what do you want me to talk about it? Change of simple math. Sign for... Oh, you would have been one of the crowd who uh, did it in ascending order. There were four people, Jason, who did it in ascending order. Are we expecting recent? I, I would. I would just decision up I, to you. I personally would just point out to them that you know the symbol just needed to go the other way, and just write a little bitty paragraph thing explaining the difference, and then just use that paragraph for all four people, so you don't have to. That's cool. I'd I'd, I'd pointed it out yeah. to them, but, uh, but well, I will point it out to them. But they, I didn't but as long as, um, PM as, them yet because I wanted to ask what you wanted done about yeah, as, them. How, how hard did you want me to beat them? No, nah, uh, as long as they understood the. Um, I mean, as long as they got the bubble sort right, then you can just point out where they... I mean, it's like someone who turned in their homework, and they didn't get a perfect grade on it, but, I mean, they did it right. It is a 101 class, so we don't have to expect... You know, some some people may not be familiar with the difference between ascending or descending and or just got it simply confused in the order things were being placed. I'm I'm very much allowing you to persuade me to your way of thinking based on the fact this is a one exactly class. with a lot with a lot of these conversations that we have. Yeah. And I'm sure people out there have already realized later, this. I'm 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 very much of the opinion that rules are well rules later when we get we into the, the I mean they've you know, some people in this class already have enough stress mm -hmm. just trying to grasp the language and thinking logically. But when we get into later classes, like a 200 series class, um, yeah, that's when things are going to really start to, to become much more strict. Yes, Moose, just the, just the CS file. Um, I, the reason I changed the instructions to explain about, um, to try and sense the whole thing was because uh, of concerns over what happens when we've got more than one CS file. But um, for the moment, you really shouldn't be, you know, the homework that we're asking to be done can all be done in your one file. Um, but yes, no, that's Okay. That. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up again uh, this coming Wednesday, so day after tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be doing another open office hours, so please join us if you've got questions or you're getting stuck in homework. We'll also be going through the current homework, uh, the, the homework that was given this last week, and explaining how that's being all put together. So again, please feel free to join us if you have questions or want to just come hang out. Um, we will be here. I will have the link up uh, sometime later tonight. It'll be available in the calendar system. Please make sure that you register for the webinar, though, so that you'll get the link and all that good information. Um, outside of that, anything else that either of you two would like to add quickly before we hit stop? No, I think okay, I'm good. Okay, good deal.
Well, that is going to conclude today's class. Once again, thank you guys very much for participating. We do appreciate it. And for those of you that will be joining us Wednesday night or Thursday night, we will see you coming up soon. Otherwise, we will see you next week. You guys all take care. Bye, everyone. See ya.